Hey folks, it's Blamo. I'm Jeremy Kirkland, and I'm back from vacation. I am. Look at me. Here I am. Well, don't look at me. You can't. But uh, I had a nice vacation. I hope you all got some time off or you got to do something. I did the whole unplug thing, you know, like I didn't check email. I didn't respond to it. I didn't really pay attention to the text messages. I just, I put the phone on DND. I just walked away. It was amazing. I, di- I didn't work at all. I did not work. And I'm very proud of that. I think it's the first vacation I have had in, I don't know, a decade where I just didn't work. I just sat there. Um, but I had my kids with me. So vacation with kids, you know, it's a little bit different. You're, you know, I'm riding planes while they're screaming, making bottles at, look, at one point, my family and I were shuffling around Atlanta airport looking for a plug to heat up a bottle because my son was losing it. And a uh, little homie wanted a hot bottle. Look, I get it. I get it. This guy. But regardless, if you ever see a family traveling, just know that they're all struggling. It is a shit show to travel with kids, especially on airplanes. Jeez Louise. But there were a few times I got some solitude, and uh, all of it was listening to the new Beach Fossils record. I mean, good lord. It's a band I've loved for years. I don't know if it's because we're about the same age, but the music that Dustin and the crew always write, I mean, it's, it's always what I want to hear when I want to hear it. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's the right stuff at the right time. Their new album, Bunny, was just released this weekend. And yeah, I'm serious. I've been listening to it nonstop. And yes, this week, Dustin Pesur, founder and vocalist for Beach Fossils, is on the pod. Wild. Who knew, right? This was a really, really enlightening interview. And it's not just because the songwriting discussion or the clothing philosophy or even the poetry deep cuts. Dustin, he just went there with me. And that's not something that everyone does on the pod. You know, you can hear it on some episodes. Some people, they don't really want to go there. But he did. And we did. Dustin and I discussed their new album, Bunny, how becoming a parent affected his songwriting, why he doesn't wear jeans anymore. Yeah, I know, kind of wild. Loving Black Timberlands, the Beach Fossil songs that won't get released, Getting Wild on Tour, and his love of poetry. It's all in there. Let's dive in. Here we go. Thanks for making the time. I, uh, I've heard the album like a bunch of times and it's, it's really, really, really good. Oh, thank you, man. Thanks. Yeah. Would, um, I mean, we can like kind of go all over the map here, but, um, is this the first full album you've done as a dad or was that your last one? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny though, because we take so long making records. I always take a really long time. Um, I don't necessarily know why. I think it's because like, I don't care how long it takes. I just want to make something that I'm proud of. So the majority of this record was actually written and recorded before I was a dad. Oh, Um, but all of the lyrics were written after I was a dad, because the way that I work is like, I just, I just do instrumentals all the time. I'm just constantly working on parts of songs. Like I'm not even really focusing on writing songs. It's just little pieces at a time. So it's like, some, you know, I'll Frankenstein things together and be like, okay, this can be a bridge, this can be a chorus, this can be a verse. Like, I have folders, like, full of ideas. It's almost like my own sample library or something. So I, like, piece everything together and I'll kind of, like, re-record it, you know, so, like, the key matches and the tempo matches. Right. Um, And then in the end, I've got, like, a ton of instrumentals that need lyrics. So I just, like, what I did was... I sat down here in the basement for two weeks and I really didn't leave or go anywhere. All I did was just like drink tons of coffee and just write lyrics nonstop. And as soon as I write something, you know, because I'm writing it right here, Mm -hmm. I got my mic right here next to me, exactly where I'm sitting now. I'll write the lyrics here. I'll turn, I'll record it in the mic. I'll write the next line. (laughs) Like it's a real just like... You know, it's almost like how people demo, except for me, there's never really a demo version. It's like the demo version is the final product. It's always like a work in progress. Did you go to like music school or anything? Or no, just ur- I'm sure just my method outfitters is like really school? fucked up. Yeah, I like, <laughs> I, I, I have no training on like playing instruments or recording or anything. It's all self-taught. So I'm sure there's a lot of stuff I'm doing that's like not traditional, but it's just what works for me. No, that's uh, well, because what you're doing, uh, you know, Rico Kasich. Well, I mean, he's dead now. 
but um, the dude from the cars. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That was like how he would write songs. Um, cool. Yeah, like basically through like blips and little pieces here and there. Because I think for folks who are listening to all this, like like some people, you know, you'll write a full song and then, or like you have the lyrics already or like people like Sufian, you know, like he'll, all the lyrics are done and then they're, he'll write a melody and then he'll just shift the words so it fits the melody more. But I think like the little, like the sample library thing is like pretty interesting. Um, yeah, the idea of like sitting down with a piano or an acoustic guitar and just like coming up with the chord progression and just like singing along to it and coming up with lyrics, that that's like so alien to me. I can't even imagine writing that way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you, when, when you're thinking of lyrics though, like you said you threw yourself down in the basement, where are you at? Are you in New York? Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. Okay. Where, where are you in Brooklyn? I'm in Bushwick. Okay. Yeah. And you, so you're there with a the fam. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I've got like a little basement studio. So, you know, if it's like three in the morning and you know, the family's asleep, I can just be working on shit and I'm not bothering anybody. Oh my God. That's the dream. Yeah, it's it's great. <laughs> so like what's the stuff that I mean cuz how how old is your is your kid? She's almost 3. Okay, so she okay, so you you got a girl. There you yeah. go. Yeah, I have I have a 5-year-old. Um and then we just had a boy in the summer. So he's like almost 10 months. Nice. But um I'm always like super super interested, especially in like people that like I mean, we're probably around the same age. I'm I'm almost 38. And um, there's like, because you came from an era where I don't know how we want to label it, but it was like the the mid aughts or early or like late aughts era where it was like Brooklyn all of a sudden was like Seattle in the 90s. You had like every band that was popping at that time. There was this like real DIY stuff, but the music that was coming out of it like had way more melody and um, like way more depth and texture into it. But the songs and the lyrics were not as rich as what I think the stuff that you're writing is now, more because of the life experiences that you have. And I'm not belittling those at all, but like as someone who's listened to you guys since, I mean, a decade off and on, I mean, shit. Um, The stuff you're writing now is like adult stuff. So I'm always like very interested in hearing musicians like write like adult situation music versus like, I met her at the bar, I was drunk, you know, we went home, you know, like that sort of stuff, like... How had how has that stuff changed your writing where you like you're you have a kid, you have you're married, you know, like there's you're you are in you own a label. I mean, what's right. that stuff been? Um, you know, like early on, I never really cared that much about lyrics. Um, you know, I was listening to a lot of shoegaze music where the vocals are just like another instrument, you know, and mm-hmm. it's not necessarily what you're saying. It's more about just capturing a mood and a feeling. Um, And I love that. You know, I listen to a lot of instrumental music and um, get a lot of inspiration from that. So, Like who? Well, like jazz music. Okay. A lot of jazz music, a lot of ambient music, um, you know, which just like is a huge, a huge mood. I mean, like I've literally cried listening to instrumental jazz music multiple occasions because it's welcome just so to the beautiful. show okay yeah. okay <laughs> like cool okay well let's let's go here <laughs> uh the first time was miles davis uh mm. i was just like listening to some miles davis and i was just like sobbing i was just like this is so <laughs> fucking amazing it was just so moving you know yeah um, dude <laughs> yeah this is when i was like a teenager you know i was like only into hardcore punk and then i started listening to jazz and i was like oh my god this is like fucking mind-blowing you know yeah um <laughs> So, you know, I don't know. Lyrics, I didn't really care that much. And the thing is, that's funny, is like, I love poetry. And I am, you know, I'm obsessive reader of poetry. And, you know, my house is like full of poetry books. And it's it's like one of my favorite forms of expression. Um, but I always felt like putting great poetry to music doesn't really work. Because, like, poetry is so free that it can be absolutely anything it wants. And it can be like, so fucking crazy and out there and unhinged and it doesn't have to have any boundaries the second you start putting words to music there's a lot of boundaries and something that might look really beautiful on paper is going to start sounding really corny once there's music behind it and it's not going to have the same meaning or feeling so you have to be really careful with the way that you're wording things and the way that you're phrasing things and even the way like the timing you know, because you could even use the same phrase, but the way that you're timing it mm-hmm. is very important with how it works with the music, whether or not it's going to have the same meaning or feeling. Um, so, you know, I've always found lyrics to be kind of difficult, despite the fact that I'm regularly writing poetry and prose on my free time. Do you um, write poetry 
outside of this that you're like, hey, that we're not, I'm never going to put music on this. Yeah. Um, but sometimes that ends up being like the inspiration for lyrics, right? Because like oh. if I'm listening to a song, um, I'll start, you know, reading through poetry that I've written and uh, I'll see certain lines and I'll be like, that expresses the feeling of this instrumental because that's that's kind of what i'm doing always is like since the instrumentals first mm -hmm. i always want to do the instrumental justice by finding like what what is this emotion that this instrumental is giving um you know and and so if i'm scrolling through some of my own poetry i'll be like okay that line definitely expresses how this song feels and and try to build from that Oh, damn. Who do you think is an example of someone that's making music now that really, really nails that? Like, I don't know, like Paul Simon is a lot of people's default, which who's a great lyricist or Dylan. But like, I feel like those dudes, I don't know, we, we only view them through like some of the best work ever. But like Dylan and Paul Simon and other folks have also written songs that are trash. I just, yeah. You know, like. <laughs> um, You know, honestly, like I don't I, I'm like, I'm really picky. And I okay. personally don't really think there are that many great lyricists out there, at least that I know of. Um, and for the most part, I do listen to music for the music and not really for the lyrics. Yeah. Um, you know, like my wife was like, for this record, you should make your lyrics as personal as possible. You know, like get really detailed, make it really personal, make it less vague than your previous records. And I was like, that sounds great. I'd love to do that. Um, and so I sat down and I was like going through music that I like and listening to lyrics and being like, okay, how have other people done this? Mm -hmm. And, um, I was like, this all fucking sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, who like, are you listening to? That sucked. Uh, you know, I don't want to get specific. I don't want to like okay, this anybody, but you know, it's like, it wasn't as impressive as I thought it was going to be. So I asked my wife to send me a playlist of like, because she listens to, to lyrics first. So I was like, make oh. me a playlist of your favorite songs with your favorite lyrics and send it to me. So she did. And um, I still wasn't really that moved. <laughs> <laughs> why not? What's, why is the bar so high? I don't think it's that the bar is so high. I think maybe it's because when I read poetry, I get a lot out of it. And I think it, I mean, I'm sure that these artists could be great poets but again i think it's the limitation of mu putting music with the lyrics it, it's just like there's so much structure that it's hard to say something in a concise way that's meaningful but i will say that two of the artists these might even be a little bit cliche but two of the artists that i did think were great uh was phoebe bridgers and maddie healy from the 1975 I was like, these are two people who are able to really say something in a meaningful and impactful way in a very few amount of words. Um, and so I thought... Do you know them personally? Uh, my wife was uh, Phoebe's A&R for a while. I don't know her personally. And, uh, and uh, Maddie is like, we have mutual friends and stuff. But So but. I, I ask that because I think sometimes when we have a deeper relationship or some sort of less degree connection with an individual, like if we feel that we can empathize with them more. Because it's like, you yeah. know, like when you listen to something like John Lennon, you know, and he's writing Imagine or whatever. The dude was rich out of his mind. Yeah. You know, like th there was, while there was an, uh, I use Lennon because it's an easy example. Like there was a desire to be like an advocate for the people, but like he's so far removed from reality at that point. You know, like I mean, if he would have been protesting, you know, wars and stuff now, he would have had personal security around him. Like, you know, so it, yeah. it's just like, it's hard to take the weight of someone's words seriously when the understanding that we have of them is basically this like, I'm on a separate cloud. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sometimes I find it hard to listen to a lot of my friends' music because I know them personally and it feels like <laughs> almost too invasive. But it sucks because like <laughs> <laughs> like so many of my friends actually like are in my favorite bands and I want to listen to their music, but I'm like is this weird that I'm just sitting around like listening to my friends' music? But <laughs> oh my god, that's a good point actually. I never really thought about that. I mean, I don't I I don't have friends on the scale that you have of like active current musicians but yeah that's yeah that's kind of weird we are like man i think uh i think i have a new thing to discuss the next time we're uh we're getting drinks it's yeah like... exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah i start i just start totally punishing them yeah you're like man you know that song there was uh because that's the worst thing right like especially for musicians where i feel like you can be criticized for a melody or a mix cut or 
too much reverb or too little reverb, whatever that is. But when things, when the criticisms be hit the lyrics, you're like, oh, dude, yeah, that's that that's my life. Like that's it's cool that you don't like my yeah. my Telecaster, but <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you know, hate on the hate on the process or or the production or whatever it is. But yeah, the the lyrics is like okay. Well, at this point, you're just like hating on my personal life experience and my perspective of the world. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, so that's the interesting thing where like I feel like people, especially now in like the social media era, where it's like it's all about giving hot takes. Hot takes are funny, but like yeah, when you clown on like a Destroyer album, right? Like Dan Behar, great lyricist kind of wacky dude, you know, talented individual. But I'm like, am I belittling this dude's life? Like, right. and then what are the artists that are more or less invincible that you can clown on their lyrics because they're so like, like, I don't, there's nothing that Drake can say ever that is going to make me take him, you know, is, is going to make me empathize with him. I, there's, it, it, it doesn't exist. It won't <laughs> ever happen. It's fine. But yeah, like I, I think about that a lot to where the vulnerability that musicians have, I think is incredibly um unappreciated right that's why i've i've never really liked um you know kind of like music criticism because you know i I don't know criticizing anyone's art in general it's like there's a big hurdle to jump over in your personal life to even get to the point that you're comfortable with making art Mm. and then even after that being comfortable enough to share it um you know, and it's like, you know, it always starts as a hobby. It starts as something just purely out of love and then, you know, develops more and more from there. And then you put it out in the world and it's no longer yours. And it's like, you're just kind of like throwing it to the hyenas. And uh, well, especially when your art is what makes a living, right? That's what, yeah. that's what gives your, your daughter the, the organic strawberries and stuff. And it's like, you know, like that, <laughs> that's, that's a different thing. Um, when yeah, it's I almost use- like a bad review is like a personal threat. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's tough because I I do believe that criticism is helpful when it's not empty, right? right. When it, it's like, hey, you know, I don't know, making this up, like, or I don't know, when you make when everyone talks about how all music is just way too over compressed, and like when people try to leave more space and air in music, like that's the fine criticize that. That's not a art criticism, more or less. But like, you know, John Caramonica and I talk about that all the time. He's the New York Times pop music critic. And he talks about how like some artists are like, we're in this like post-criticism landscape uh, in the sense that some people where it's like, you you don't need criticism anymore because you just, you know, you're, you're so big that you're like Taylor Swift is in, is an example of someone who you good reviews, bad reviews. It doesn't matter. She's immune to everything. Um, and so, you know, and now like, what is the empathy that listeners have against them? I mean, it, it's, she's just a whole other Phoebe Bridgers is approaching that if she's not there already. Right. Um, yeah. but I think she's a more talented lyricist. Uh, sorry, shots fired, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, um, I do think criticism is important, especially if it's constructive. Um, I do also understand that there's fun and just like talking shit, especially if it's someone who's like massive and you can tell has like an ego that's completely out of control. Yeah. It's like, all right, let's like poke some holes in this because it's like, it's good fun, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because why not? You know, like Bono's never going to get bombed, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Uh, I was like, he's going to say Bono. He's going to say Bono. (laughs) (laughs) that's just an easy one you know yeah but uh you know i i don't know it's like but at that point it's like is someone on that scale even writing because they like have a burning desire to share their personal experiences or or is it just like a business and that needs to just keep churning out a product there i mean that's the million dollar question um when i was recording and really trying to like go at it really hard i was chris walla who is not in Death Cab anymore, but at the time, uh, I think their their album on Atlantic had just come out. And so they were like, they were big. Um, this wasn't like um, photo album stuff. So um, I was talking to him about songwriting and he was like, yeah, he's like, it's hard because, you know, you have, we have the label and the A&R that wants to change this or change this. And he's like, the, the most successful musicians are the ones who can compromise their art the least and yeah. still make a living. He's like, but you can't, you can't really make your art and not compromise on it to live off of it. And that's something I don't know, people, some may disagree on, but like, that's something I think about a ton when you think about people that like yourself who make a living off of their music. Right. I think, I think I'm, in like a lucky enough position that the compromises I make are 
very small and maybe even in some ways like symbiotic compromises mm. because it's like um i never know what's going to resonate with people when i'm working on music i mean to me it's like every song i put the same amount of myself into it um and it's surprising to see which songs become really meaningful to people and especially if they're not singles you know and it's like they're just mm. on the album and they become like a song that's a real moment in a live show or a song that's like really killing it on streaming and not because of like a tiktok thing but because like <laughs> people are just genuinely getting into this one song yeah yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's really cool because i see what is like moving people and that can help me like understand where i can explore more on the next record um because i'm like okay well this is something that has meant something to people so let me dig at this a little bit more see what see what else i can find in this type of area um or you know a song that just like is so fun to play live and like people are moving to every night you know like um you know like there's a there's a new song actually we just put it out today it's it's called second oh yeah, yeah. great song it's like one of my favorite songs on the record but i also did not think it should be a single i was like this is just an album track uh my wife like pushed really hard for it to be a single you know we, we own the label together so uh you know I, t I took her i took her word for it and um you know we started playing it live already on this previous tour in australia and it was like the highlight of the live show for me i was like this song is now going going to be a permanent staple of the live show because it's so fucking fun to play oh and, damn yeah and like you know getting that immediate feedback from playing it live and and seeing people like moving to it, a song that they've never heard before, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, uh, immediate feedback is really useful and helpful. And it's not like I'm trying to, I'm like, okay, this is like a great product. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, this is really, this is really resonating with people. So like, you know, I, I, I get to lean into this and it's fun. Well, but do you think, and this was not intentional at all, I don't know how we got here, but like, do you think that's because this album has got heavy shit on it? It's, like, I mean, really heavy stuff. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I guess my lyrics are more vague early on because I thought if I got too personal, it would almost be like alienating. Yeah. Because it's like, okay, this is like too specific. Um, but I realized like the more specific you can be with your lyrics, the more people are even going to feel it because there's so many like shared human experiences in all of these types of moments that I think everybody has, you know, and even if it's like, this is the way that this happened in my life, it's probably happened to someone else in their life in a slightly different way, but in a way that is still going to be, you know, they can still latch on to to what I'm saying there, what I'm expressing. I mean, that that to me is like the best, at least for me, that's how I connect with art, is knowing the, the life that the person lived and what they experienced that led them to create that, right? Yeah. Like, you know... Like, so example, like my mom is, she's doing way better now, but she, you know, she surprised us over the holidays, letting us know she had breast cancer and she had to get a double mastectomy. And my dad is in the process of, of, of dying. You know, all these things are happening to where it's like, I'm, you know, and people who've listened to this, I've shared this stuff before. Um, like it's heavy stuff that's on my life. And so I'm not so much like trying to figure out or complaining about, the L train and something stupid that existed when I lived in Brooklyn. But like now it's like, okay, like I have a daughter and she's into music all of a sudden and I have a son and you know, I'm at that level of my life where I'm becoming the parent to my parents and trying to figure out how I'm supposed to be a parent to my own kids. And so like hearing even whispers of that in music for me makes one makes me feel that I'm not alone because even though we're so connected online, I don't think the depth of our relationships with individuals have really increased. If anything, it's decreased. And so like that, knowing that there's empathy, right, I think is is what pushes my relationship with art more than ever. Yeah. And I think that's like, you know, the whole point of art too is like i'm feeling these things or i'm experiencing these things that are so overwhelming that i'm i'm overflowing with the way that i feel about it or obsessing over thinking about this that like i just have to get this out there like the pressure's too high like art mm. has to be the expression you know and uh i think for a lot of people that can be going to therapy um which i've never done and i could 
probably benefit really? from, but yeah. No, I see. Oh, I'm okay. I'm shocked. It sounds yeah. like you, we've been through it. Maybe you just have a good relationship with your wife. <laughs> there you go. Like there's some, there's some health there. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I don't know. I, I, music has always been the place that I can turn to when I'm having a hard time, which is funny because like, if you listen to my lyrics, my whole life probably sounds like a hard time, which it's not. <laughs> my, <laughs> but it's my like, struggle. <laughs> music is just where I can get it out though, you know? So it's like, I turn to music for that. So, so, you know, yeah, the lyrics end up being heavy as a result. Yeah. But I would say there's, it's, you know, again, because as someone who's listened to more or less your, the library of Beach Fossils. I think there's a lot of your music, and you've talked about this too, it's very happy, especially early on. Yeah. But at the time when you were writing that, correct me if I'm wrong, you were like the most depressed you had ever been. Yeah, it was escapism. That's, it's, yeah. Yeah. And I was kind of worried that like, once I got married and, and you know, my music career took off and I started like having a more stable life. I was like, am I going to like not have anything to write about anymore? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's true. I mean, there's, there's a reason why a lot of people like have stunted adulthood is they feel like if they, they settle down, I'm air quoting, um, they, they don't have anything that makes them relatable anymore. Right. But you know, I think like no matter what, you can't escape the human experience. You know, you can't escape pain. You can't escape death. Bars. You know, <laughs> you can't escape all of the things that just make you a human. And you're constantly vulnerable, you know, uh, just a bag of flesh. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to trying to go through day to day, you know. And um, I think that experience is extremely nuanced and it can be beautiful and it can be really hard. And, and the most important thing for me is through lyrics, expressing that, expressing the good and the bad in the same song and even in the same line, because that whole balance is just what makes it what it is. I mean, that, that's just the truth at the end of the day. Do you think about your daughter listening to your music when she's older and being like, yo, what's going on with my dad? Yeah, definitely. I was worried about that a little bit. There were some nights where like I couldn't sleep after we had like mastered the record because I was like, okay, the record's done. It's been sent out to the pressing plant. It's being made. Like I can't make any more changes. And I was like, should I have not put that line on oh. this record? Because when my daughter gets old enough to listen to it, she's going to have questions that I'm going to have to explain, which it's okay. I'm okay explaining it. But I really hope that I'm not setting a bad example because like I your whole thing when you have a kid is like you want them to be the best version of a human being that can possibly exist. Mm -hmm. and you want to do everything you can to make that right. And it's so scary knowing that I've like publicly potentially like said things about myself or my life and like put these flaws out there in a way that like everyone can see it. My whole family can see it, you know, and it's like. But you can't worry about that. That's the thing is like when you're working on something, you can't think about that. It has to be just you and the art. And and if it's going to be embarrassing or tough to talk about, then that's more the reason to keep it in. Yeah. I mean, I think that therein lies every artist's dilemma. I mean, in, in that issue, because like I think about that a ton with my dad. Like, so, you know, during one of the things that happened during COVID is my mom was like, hey, like my dad used to be in a band. He played with um, the dudes in America. He uh -huh. like wrote a bunch of, you know, it's very like 80s synth pop stuff. It's it's actually some of it's fucking great. There's cool. some of it that's not good at all. I'll just be honest. But yeah. like there's stuff on there that's really, really good. And my mom was like, hey, could you find a way to like get this online, like get this on Spotify, like figured out. And I had this total different understanding of my dad because you know how, like, so I was using like TuneCore and, um, and so you can actually type in the lyrics and that way the lyrics show up when people are searching for it and stuff like that. And so I didn't have the lyrics. So I was listening to the words and typing the lyrics as I heard them. Wow. And so like you have this different level of understanding in the music. And this is my dad when he's in his like late 20s and he's like singing about stuff. He's singing about like being a parent, like not really wanting to do it. Um, like, But there was this really beautiful vulnerability that existed. And I'm so grateful for that, even though the stuff that I heard was not really what I wanted to hear because I can't have that conversation with him now. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And so I, I say this one to cheer you on in the sense that like, I think that that is what will give like a, a 
bigger appreciation and empathy. I mean, the key with all this stuff is empathy, you know, right. with, with your daughter or additional kids, I don't know, whatever you guys are going to do, you know, but like, that's, that's the heavy shit is you're like, oh man, like my parents were human. Yeah. And it makes me reevaluate. Obviously now I'm sure like, do you look back at your parents? I mean, you know, and, and the, the intentions that they had for better or for worse when it's like, man, they were just trying to like get by and do, and, and, you know, and raise you right. Whatever totally. that looks like. Yeah. I mean, my parents are both musicians and they still email me songs regularly. My dad just emailed me a song last night. And, you oh, know, my so mom, cool. like, just, uh, they, like, just mastered, like, a record that she was working on, and, like, my dad produced it. So they're still making music, and, you know, my mom's lyrics are, like, very personal, like, ext- like the most personal lyrics you can imagine, because, like, she doesn't do it professionally, and there's yeah. no expectation of an audience, so oh, it's, wow. like, it's, it's, like, the most personal lyrics that could ever happen. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I take from that and I, and I, I'm inspired by that. And, um, even to a point where I'm, I listen to it and I'm like, I don't think I could even get that personal in my, in my own lyrics because there's like too many people listening. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but I think it's beautiful, you know, cause like the, the songs that she just finished up are songs that she's been writing like since I was a baby and she finally recorded them. You know, like after all this time. Um, Wow. And it's so cool because it's like I grew up hearing these songs to the point that they were just like background music almost because she was always playing guitar. And now that I'm older, I listen to the lyrics and I, I get a lot of new meaning out of it, especially after becoming a parent myself. Yeah, like did did you have any hand in getting that music made? I mean, because even though you said you weren't trained or anything, I mean, you're pretty accomplished, you know, musician in terms of how you're recording and making music. (laughs) Well. Like when I was a kid, I had an interest in music, uh, just cause there's like generations of music in my family. My, yeah, yeah. my mom and, and grandfather, uh, you know, they're, they're from Cuba. So my grandfather's a percussionist and a singer. Um, and you know, my mom kind of grew up in that musical household. And so by nature I did as well. And, um, so it was always something open for me to explore and, um, you know, I started playing, like picked up the guitar in the house, like when I was eight and just started playing. And my dad was like, do you want to get lessons? And I was like, no, I don't. Like, I was like very, very against getting lessons because I was worried that someone would like come in and change my style or my approach. Uh. (laughs) And like, I I, like very early on, like immediately started experimenting with alternate tunings and just like, you know, like, like, dad gad and shit or just like making shit up like i didn't even know about that yet you know i was just like oh if i like put these in this tuning this sounds really cool and i like was writing songs and open tunings um and so it was always like this just like personal approach and and um when i was in middle school my dad gifted me like an old four track of his and um, oh yeah i mean that summer like i was writing like three songs a day, probably, you know, just like recording. Do you still have that stuff? I do actually. (laughs) Okay. Hell yeah. yeah. Good. Good. It's really, it's like, um, the basement tapes. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, well, at the time I was like in the new metal, you know, so it's just like me like playing distorted, you know, detuned guitar, uh, just screaming with like a very, a very high child voice just being, cause you were into rage against the machine, right? Isn't that, that's what kind of, yeah, my dad had like a Rage Against the Machine tape and that kind of changed my <laughs> so life in a way. Crazy. And like my uncle had given me like a ministry tape and like like filth pig, like like ministry. The yeah, band? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Psalm 69. Oh and uh, you know, that's the stuff I was getting into. And you know, my dad was really into Pantera and White Zombie and stuff. So Oh my god. That was like kind okay. of kind of my first like relationship with with like music and making music. Yeah, my dad loved Tool. Yeah, same. My dad was huge. I and mean, I, was I, like, I went and saw what? Tool with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember my dad was like, man, man or James Keenan. And, and, you know, he was, I think this, I was a little bit older, but Lateralist had just come out. And this, there's a song called Schism. Yeah. And um, it's this weird sort of rolling bass lick and you know he was my dad was always obsessed with like the production quality and always snare drums he'd be like listen to that snare yeah he's like you know how hard it is to get a a snare sound like it's true yeah i listen to the (laughs) snare all the time 
<laughs> Especially when I'm out at a restaurant, you know, it's like kind of hard to hear what's going on, but you hear the drums and I'm like, man, that snare sounds really good. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah, there's so much stuff too that even now, and I mean, that some folks who hear this, I've talked about this a ton where I like, I got a, um, I got a, uh, a DAC, um, so I could listen to high res audio stuff because I was like, all the music I listen to is on AirPods at, yeah. you know, shitty bit rate. I'm not, you know, I'm not getting the full experience. Then I, then I was beating myself up saying that I wasn't respecting the artist all of a sudden because I'm not listening to it in the environment they want it, which is, I recognize is not imposed, but like, you know, and I started really sitting and like, instead of watching a movie, I would sit and listen to an album totally. and it like fucking blew my mind. And now all I want to do, you know, cause like I know the Destner twins, uh, and like the national folks from, from, uh, 4AD era. And, um, I like feel like I can't do their music justice unless I sit and listen to it start to finish and is the highest bit rate I can and really like analyze it. And I'll like, you know, write little notes. And even though, I mean, I, I don't really connect with any of Matt's lyrics at all. Um, no shots or anything, but just like trying to experience their art in a certain way. And it just like when you think now of like all the tools that are available to people for production and what stuff still comes out of it. I, I don't know. I'm just always really, really inspired. It makes me want to make music, even though all I do is play Jim Croce songs for my kids. Like that's cool. Though. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, I, I've, I've, I, I, uh, I tried and, and, uh, it didn't work and it's fine, you know, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I think about that stuff a ton of just like trying to listen to it and like the artist's intention. You yeah. Know? But, I mean, I, you know, that's how I listen to music too. And so it takes me a really long time when an artist I love puts out a new album. Like I've literally gone maybe like a span of like six months to like two years even to like getting around to listening to it because I'm like, I need to have time where no one's going to bother me and I can just yes, put this yes. on and like yeah. lay down on my bed or lay down on the floor with my headphones and just listen to it beginning to end like two or three times in a row because that's yeah. the only way I'm going to understand it and I want to be able to take everything in cuz those first few listens it's like it's like when you first you can't take like one sip of wine and just be like I know what this is about you know you got to come back to it a few times and and yeah. know, it's different every time and and um I don't expect people to do that with my music. Um, but that's the way that I listen to other people's music. And that's the way that I listen to my own music when I've finished a record as well, because that's the only way that I can even understand what this album is, you know? Otherwise, there's like it, not enough context. Yeah. If there were like three albums off the top of your head that are, that you would recommend someone listen to <laughs> start to finish uninterrupted, what would it be? Mm, it's hard. Probably like uh, Velvet Underground, like, self-titled oh okay um, didn't expect that one yeah i mean maybe it's like an obvious pick but i th maybe it's obvious for like a reason uh, i figured you'd say blood on the tracks or something yeah oh yeah i mean you know yeah that's a good one that's a great one um i think stereo lab dots and loops okay that's... now we're talking <laughs> yeah all right that's one that is just like i think really important to listen to beginning to end um, okay stereo lab i have a theory they're the most like one of the most underrated, unappreciated bands, and yeah. they're totally aware of it. And I feel like they write music to stay in that realm. Well, Tim Gain, like, what is like such an amazing artist because the trajectory of the music that he made is like so fucking cool. Because the first project that he had was a harsh noise project, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I mean, it's awesome, and that's a, already a great way to start making music. Then the second project was McCarthy, which is like one of the biggest inspirations on like Beach Fossil's music, just like jangly 12 string guitar music, very political lyrics, um, yeah, yep. you know, just incredible. And then Stereolab, which is just like, you can't touch it. You know, like if you're listening to Stereolab and you want to listen to something else that sounds like Stereolab that isn't Stereolab after, there's not many options. You know, you have, you know, like broadcast and stuff like that, but it's like yeah. they really have such a beautiful specific sound that like no one can really do in the same way. Co so Cobra and Phases is probably one of my favorite albums, which was Jim O'Rourke was on that. And um, I don't think I understood it better until maybe the past few years and that was an album that i got early on for cool points with other friends <laughs> but i didn't get and so i would like pretend 
that I was super into, yeah, like Dots and Loops and, and, and Emperor Tomato Ketchup and all that stuff. But like even the song Emperor Tomato Ketchup, like it's like a six minute intro, yeah, you know, of the same fucking chord over yeah, and over yeah. again. And like I would pretend that I really understood it and I had no <laughs> idea and I thought it was a trash song. Yeah. But it was only <laughs> until recently that I've been like, damn, like, I yeah, Stereo Lab to this day continues to be like some of the most perplexing stuff I've ever heard. It's cool. I mean, they combine a lot of awesome different types of elements. Like there's psychedelic music, there's lounge yep. music, there's kraut rock, there's yep. uh I mean, it, you know, there's elements of shoegaze, like there's so many different kinds of things going on at once. Uh and they do it in a way that feels so effortless. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And and here's the other thing which we'll we'll talk about. I don't know of a band that looked cooler than them. Yeah. And like people are going to say craft work, but it's like a uniform with all due respect. I, I don't think a uniform it, it is, especially a uniform is like goofy as theirs. Right. I don't think that is like personal style, Yeah. but like stereo lab, honestly, I think you guys are up there and I don't know if there's intention behind it. A lot of people are going to say turnstile is like the coolest looking band now, but I yeah. don't, I don't know if, if it's purposeful or not. But I feel like your guys is it's it's non intentional. Therefore, there's more attitude behind it or, or truth behind it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I feel like you know, you just gotta like, you just gotta wear what you love. So, do you when you guys are okay? You were just in Australia. How much thought goes into like tour stage clothes and gear, or are you like, I grab the shirt that fits, I put it in the bag, and I go. Well, yeah, I don't wear things on stage that I don't just like wear in normal life, like. When you see me on stage, like I've been wearing that all day. I was in the airport with it, you know. Um, really? Yeah, I don't want to like put on a different persona because that defeats the purpose. Like, because for me, it's like Beach Fossils is like uh, all about self expression and like the lyrics are just like personal and self expression. So, like, why would I put on a different character of myself on mm. stage than I am off stage? I, I, I try to be okay. the same person everywhere I go. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's definitely thought behind it, you know, like I care about what I wear. Um, you know, I, I uh, my style is like kind of always evolving and I'm but I'm always trying to d dress in a way that is very like simple and understated yet like expresses who I am, uh -huh. uh, you know. So I don't know, I've, as I've gotten older, it's just been like a blend of a lot of different things. Um, you know, I mean, for the past like eight years or so, like I've just been like black Tim's goes with literally everything. It's easy. You can wear it in the snow. You can wear it in the summer. Like it's effective. It goes with any kind of pant. <laughs> True. And like, I don't wear True. jeans anymore. I just started wearing dress pants because they're more comfortable and they look better. They also go with everything. And I'm like, I don't know, just throw on a t-shirt, open button up or just like a simple jacket. Just go back. Dang. To I'm very, in I'm very inspired by like, like, uh, 60s mod style yeah um that is that's like some of the coolest way i think anybody can dress um you know and uh you know that kind of style is just like sharp it's easy it's timeless it's never gonna look bad you're never gonna look at a picture of a mod and be like what were they wearing why were they wearing that that looks so stupid it's just like it just <laughs> looks so fucking cool it's timeless you can't beat it you know it's like classy but they also look like they could kick your ass yeah you know it's like a rugged kind of handsomeness <laughs> have you guys gotten hit up by like Gucci or brands to dress you yet? Because I feel like the the Eddie Slimane Saint Laurent thing is going to happen soon. Uh, we haven't, but um, but I don't know. I I'm very careful about the way that I um, that I come across to people, you know, because like I never want to seem like too cool or like unapproachable or something, you know. Like I I like I hate rock and roll. I really fucking hate <laughs> rock and roll. And like, I hate... Wait, define define rock and roll real quick so I think people understand this. Uh, You know, like Aerosmith and Guns N' Roses and stuff, I guess. Like, I don't okay. know. It's just really not my thing. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know, it's just too... It's just like all ego. And, um, <laughs> you know, I just, I just feel like a lot of times when bands start getting styled by like brands, they just oh, yeah, start to look like really rock and roll. And like... The only time I ever think it looks cool is when it's rappers, because like rappers naturally just like look fucking cooler. They carry themselves in like a way that's like effortlessly cool. And mm -hmm. like they're not trying to be a rock star. They just like literally are a fucking badass. And like <laughs> there's no faking the personality. You, you know, like 
you can dress up like a corny indie rock band and like make them look cool, but they're not going to actually look cool. They're just going to look like the clothes is going to be wearing them. Whereas like, oh, damn, you know, like a rapper in Gucci, like they're fucking wearing the clothes. The clothes isn't wearing them. No, I just like I don't ever want to dress in a way that I think doesn't represent me. You know, it's like, what's the point? This whole fucking thing. If you see a picture <laughs> I mean, you're exactly of me, right, you're seeing yeah. a picture of me. I don't want you to see a picture of somebody else or a representation. Okay, so the music video for Don't Fade Away, the suit, yeah. banging suit. Thanks. How much How much thought was, was placed into that? Or were you just like... Well, I'm just really into suits. I have like 10 suits. No, I probably have more. Okay. I probably have like 15 suits. It's it's kind of excessive. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Wait, where, where are you getting your suits? Uh, all kinds of different places. Now I get them custom made. I get them like, uh, you know, I have my measurements. and uh, From who? Uh, this site called uh, Studio Suits. It's kind of like you just oh, put okay. in your measurements and they have like hundreds, if not thousands of different like materials and, and patterns and stuff. So I get all my pants made there. It, like literally every pair of pants I, made, I wear is from there. Um Cause it's like your measurements are saved. So anytime I want a new pair of pants, I already know it's going to fit perfectly. So I do that. And, um, yeah, I got a bunch of suits. Uh, you know, I have like a bunch of, you know, I don't go that crazy. I've got like a Dolce and Gabbana suit, but I've got like, uh, you know, just like the Ralph Lauren suits are classic. They're simple. They fit well. They're not too tight. They're not too big, you know? And I feel like, yeah, to me, it's like, if there's an element of like sort of dressed up, but sort of tough, that that's like the best combination. Yeah. I, uh, when I think about like, like Jack White or the White Stripe stuff, like those those folks, like, and I've met Jack, you know, before where it's like there there is a persona of them playing live. Yeah. Like that's like, that's not how Jack dresses, right. you know, in real life or whatever. And I like, I remember when I learned that, I was a little bummed. Yeah. Like, I, you're like, I, dang. I, think like, <laughs> I don't know. You know, the thing that really bugs me, I guess, is a lot of the uh, emphasis on it being entertainment. Oh, okay. Cause like, to me, it's like at that point it becomes like a fucking Vegas show or something, you know, it's like, what's the point? Yep. Like why, <laughs> you know, like who cares? The point is the private jets yeah. and the, and the, I guess so. <laughs> I just like, I have no interest in just like being an entertainer for entertainer for entertainment's sake. Um, mm. you know, like I love being an entertainer. I mean, it's part of what I do. I go on stage and I have a fucking wild time and we play a rowdy show and we have a lot of fun, but like none of that's fake and none of that's planned, you know, right, like it's right, all spontaneous right, right. and we're just up there having mm. fun. And like, if we're not having fun, I'm not going to fake it, you know? Yeah. Have you had to, uh, cancel a bunch of shows or anything to like, did COVID mess you guys up too much? We had to reschedule a tour a few times but it's okay you know it ended up working out i but like everyone did yeah yeah exactly but like you know non kind of covid times related um i try to never cancel shows you know i think i've only done it like one or two times because like i was injured and had to go to the hospital or something you know like i never i never want to cancel like i've played i've had extremely awful food poisoning to the point that i thought i was maybe gonna die twice mm -hmm. and i've yep. played shows both times and i can't believe i did it and i but it's like i'm in like taiwan or something you know and i'm like when am i going to be back here let me just yeah. fucking play the show <laughs> so you had like flu games you had jordan flu games basically i've like i've played a show where i'm like i may need to run off stage and like throw up or shit you know <laughs> <laughs> but like you know i want to play the show it's fun yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's got to be nuts. I don't know. Like, I've had that stuff happen before where it's like whenever I would play shows, which were never to be that big of people. I mean, I think we play like Bowery or I think maybe the 930 Club, like yeah. the older one was maybe like one of the bigger ones we did. And I had like just crazy like anxiety and stomach issues. Like, and I just couldn't, I couldn't swing it. And yeah. so I, I'm like, literally like, okay, like if I, this is my code, which is like someone do something so I can go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> there've, there've been like maybe two times that I've wanted to walk off stage mid show. Um, but I feel like I owe it to myself and the people who have paid to come to the show to not do that. Yeah, yeah. But like, I mean, there, you know, there was a time where we were like very deep on tour towards the end of the tour where like things have just gone really sour. This was like an old lineup, like people who aren't in, in the band anymore. And, you know, there mm -hmm. were like actual like physical fist fights and stuff happening, oh like, you know, backstage or the night before or whatever. And it's just like, we don't want to be here right now, you know, <laughs> and like, <laughs> I just want to fucking go home right now. But I owe it. Yeah, I owe it to everybody to to 
finish the show, you know, and, and, um, you know, whatever's happening off stage, whatever, like sour experiences we're having, like the show is the most important part. And that's the part where I can still have fun. So like, let me at least have this like hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to the whole thing where it's like, this always starts as a hobby. It starts as fun. And, uh, yeah, if you start losing that, it's just like, it, it sucks. Cause like music is music is like the most important thing in my life. And if it got so big that it was like out of my control or out of my hands, I wouldn't even want to do it anymore. You know, like mm. I, I have to continue doing it for me. Otherwise there's no purpose. Do you ever write songs that you're like, this is a great song. I'm never going to release it. Yeah. I have a lot of that. I mean, oh, I, I have like hundreds of demos on my computer and there are songs that within the band we consider like Beach Fossils classics. Like every time we get together for practice or whatever, we play these songs. And for some reason, we've just never put them on a record and maybe never will. And I don't really know why. Maybe it just doesn't feel like it fits on a record or maybe it feels mm. like it's been too long. Um, but in a way, it's kind of nice that we have these songs that are just for us. Yeah, I mean, I think about that a lot too. When you think about other, you know, everyone <clears throat> uses like the Beatles as an example to where it's like when they stopped trying to constrain themselves by what they could perform live yeah. and just started making music, there was a, a different, you know, thing that was tapped in them. Yeah, you can experiment with like whatever. I mean, that's like, uh, yeah, we, we did a lot of that. Like with Somersault, we were like, okay, yeah. we're just going to make a record for the sake of a record and we'll figure out how to play it live after it's done. And even with this new record, like, this one is kind of more simple. Bunny is like more of like a return to form. Yeah. It's more stripped down. But the problem is there's so many alternate tunings that uh -oh. like we're figuring out how we're going to do it live because it's like we're going to have to either bring like a million guitars or bring like a guitar tech or, you know, we're going to have to figure out because uh, the fucked up thing is like, like I was telling you earlier, we write a lot of songs in parts. So it's like uh -huh. the bridge is in a different tuning than like the chorus or the verse. They're like, what? It's so like, you'd have to switch a guitar mid song? It's like multiple alternate tunings. So what we're doing <laughs> is we have to find a new alternate tuning that wasn't on the recording where you can play both of those parts on it. And it's really complicated. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. But we just were, you know, yeah, we were just doing it for the sake of the song at the time. We're like, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say that that's uh that's definitely gonna add a, a layer in there. Yeah, I have some where like there, there's one song where um this is on May first from Somersault where when we play it live, I actually like have to play the first part of the song with a capo and I have to take it off while I'm playing and like continue playing the next part. And there's like no other way for me to do it. <laughs> oh man, there you go. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, I definitely time for a guitar tech. Yeah, it's fun though. It keeps me on my toes, you know. Yeah. So you're gonna tour what like next month? No. Um. We actually have like the majority of the summer off, which is awesome because we're never here for the summer. We're always touring. So, um, yeah, I believe the tour is going to be uh, this fall. Hasn't been announced yet. It's still being worked on. But, uh, yeah, we're going to like have a okay. few months home before, you know, after the record's out, people can take some time to digest it. We can have some time home chill for a little bit and then hit the road nonstop for the next like year and a half. Jeez Louise. <laughs> are you, are you going to tour like through the smaller cities and stuff too? Cause I feel like, so I, I live in St. Louis now. I used to live in New York for what we lived in Brooklyn for like, I don't know, 16 some odd years. Yeah. Loved it. Um, moved during COVID. Now I'm in New York once a month, um, for like recording or traveling or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but the cool thing is like seeing bands here yeah. in St. Louis, Yeah, yeah. it's, it's way cheaper. The venues are better. They're cleaner. They're, um, I mean, I don't know, like I'm pretty biased now, but like, yeah, I'm going to go see like Robin Fleet Foxes nice. in like a month yeah. at a brand new, beautiful venue, you know, like Phoebe came through here and, you know, I mean, it's just, I don't know, but like, I, I'm curious, like. But some folks are like, yeah, well, I don't want to fucking roll through St. Louis and Omaha. Right, right. But it's like, you'll still sell way more merch than you would with the people that you had to comp to get into the big city shows. That's true, yeah. I mean, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and like bands would skip over us all the time. They'd go to like DC or Atlanta or something. And then yeah. when someone would come to Charlotte, like, you know, I mean, it was just like the most exciting thing. Like me and all my friends and everybody, we would all go to the show. We would go fucking ape shit, you know, and like. Yeah, Those kind of shows are so fun to play because it's like, you know, like Florida, for example, we go down to Florida. It's like it's hard for bands to go down there because there's there's no way out. Once you go down, you, you got to yeah. go to just go back up through it. So it's like, you know, you go down there. People are so ready for for music that like they just go nuts. And it's so much fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, hopefully you guys get to hit those uh, other cities. I mean, I'm sure that's a better yeah, yeah. setup. Yeah, it's still being worked on um, right now, so I don't know like the full details, but yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, what What are the plans for the summer? So like you basically, you, the album's about done. You're probably in press mode right now. Yeah. And then what are you going to do? Are you, you uh, taking time off with the kids? You guys leaving town or? Yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, just get to have a summer like home with the family and get to chill for a little bit before I'm gone for a long time. Uh, you know, I don't know. Summer in New York is amazing. It's like it's crazy. Really? I love it, dude. It's like a it's like a fucking party. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess like if you have central air and shit. Yeah, yeah. You know, but like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I got the mini splits. I'm good. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think it is funny because like most of the rich people peace out and then, you know, Brooklyn in the summer is pretty great. Yeah. Tons of restaurants, yeah. tons of places just chill and lie low. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's true. There's, there's, there's a good vibe out there. Yeah. It's a good time. Um, do you like, what are you doing to kind of like recharge then? Is it like, do you make more music? Do, do you ever stop? Or is it like, you know, the door stays closed and now you're, I don't know, rewatching the wire or playing video games? Uh, it's a little bit of all of that. Yeah. It's like, I never really stop making music, but, um, I think I need to, I'm in the process right now of kind of like revamping my social life because like after COVID lockdown and having a kid and finishing this new record, I've had no time to like see friends or hang out with people or anything. I've just been like so busy. So um, I think this summer is going to be the summer of like just hanging out with friends, you know, just laying in the park, chilling, fucking doing all the things that I need to do. Also working on music, also playing video games, just living my life for me. Oh, wait, you do play video games. What do you play? Oh, I'm not that big of a gamer. I just play Switch. I just love Mario Kart and Mario Party and stuff. I I play like socially. I just like, you know, it's fun to just get like a big group of people over and just like have some drinks and just, you know, play some Nintendo. Get ready for uh, Friday, New Zelda. It's the whole half the world's going to shut down oh, wow. playing this fucking game see i can't do the um, like big long immersive games like that because like um because you're an adult no i just like <laughs> i uh i've i'm really add and like growing up i've never been able to like focus on a game that like is too long or too involved especially if it's single player it's kind of like a not like i can't read novels that's just like why i read poetry i'm just like i have no attention span so I need like oh. I need those quick like dopamine bursts of just like a, a Mario Kart race. Um, who do you think is one of the most like underrated poets? If someone's like, man, all right, this was great. Dustin's a G. What's a poet I should check out? Um, I have two in my head, but the problem okay. is I get into I got into poetry by myself, so I literally don't even know how to pronounce their names. So I don't even want to say it here because I'm just gonna botch it. <laughs> Fair. I'll text you later. Totally fine. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's a uh, yeah, that's a that's a very real thing. I've I've had that happen where uh, I'm like trying to. I I used to. I mean, I was never like big into Nietzsche or whatever, yeah. but I was like Nietzsche. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And people are like you clown. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, you know, I mean, like, I didn't go to school for for this kind of stuff. Like, I got into poetry on my own, and um, I just dig deeper and deeper. And like, I don't have any fucking friends that are into poetry. Like, I don't know anybody that reads poetry. So for me, it's just like it's just a very personal interest that I have, and I don't have anyone to talk to about it. So like, I get into like some, poetry club, the Beach Fossils that would Poetry be sick, Club, started up. Yeah. yeah, I get into like a lot of weird fucking books that like are kind of hard to find and and I literally don't know how to pronounce the name of the author. <laughs> um, you know, okay, here's a very underrated poet, uh Billy Corgan. Oh yeah. Dude, I, dead serious. I, Crazy good shit. I just cut him off in the security line at the airport in Australia on accident because I didn't even see him. What? How did you not see him? He's like 10 feet tall. <laughs> I just, I just like had my blinders on, you know, it's the airport. And like, I was like trying Fair. to get through security and they were like opening the little thing to let some people through. And I was like, nah, fuck that. I was here first. So I just like went through as fast <laughs> as I could. And then later when my bandmates met up with me past the security, they were like, you just cut off Billy Corgan in line. I was like, I didn't even see him. Uh, but we went to oh the little God. virgin club and, um, James Addiction and Smashing Pumpkins were both back there because they were touring at the same time as us. And uh, we saw James Eha back there. And yeah. I was like fucking geeking out. I was like, I'm not going to say what's up to him. I'm not going to be a punisher. But like, I just am stoked that I'm in the presence of this dude right now. Wait, OK. Wouldn't you want that? If So say you're in the lounge and there is a total beach fossils, beachhead, whatever you want to yeah. call them. And they're losing their shit that you're there. Wouldn't it be nice if that person came up to you and was like, hey, your music is a big deal for me and I appreciate it. Wouldn't you get like a little pep in your step or would you be like to me i would find it like extremely meaningful and i would like engage in the conversation and have fun but i think like 
if you're in the Smashing Pumpkins and you've been doing it for decades, like you're probably in the Virgin Club because like you don't want someone to come up to you. I don't know. Mm. He does seem okay. like a chiller though. I mean, he looks like a very nice guy. You just look at him and you're like, I could fucking hang out with this guy. Maybe we'll cross paths yeah. again eventually. Dude, you got to do it. There's there's your challenge because yeah. <laughs> you're going to hit the road. I'm sure you're going to play festivals and stuff. Mm -hmm. Just hit him up. I don't know. Maybe I'll make it happen. I will say though, there's been issues in the past where I have gone at people where I thought they would be really receptive. Yeah. And I, I like, I know how to talk to someone without, you know, it's not like I'm in their face. I, I don't want autographs. I don't want pictures. Yeah. But a lot of times I want to be like, hey, this this was important to me. Thank you. Yeah. It's just a thank you. And occasionally I've gotten like, what? You know, and it's, uh, yeah, I, there's been um, a few times I've dropped some albums because of that. <laughs> I usually like, I usually will only talk to someone like that if there's an introduction, you know, if we have like mutual friends. Um, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, okay, I, you know, there's like a reason for me to be talking to this person and not just be a punisher. But, you know, every now and then I'll go out like we, pl we played a festival and it was like, um, you know, one of the versions of Black Flag with Keith Morris. And he was like my favorite singer of Black Flag. I fucking love Circle Jerks and stuff. And I saw him backstage and I went up to him and I was just like, you know, wanted to say what's up. And like, he did not give a fuck. And like, I don't blame <laughs> him for not giving a fuck because the thing is, I didn't no, have, you should. I didn't have anything to say i was just like i can't believe he's here right now i just want to say what's up and like it was just like i didn't have anything original to say i was just like you but you didn't want anything from him right did, no did you want a photo did you want an no, autograph no, i or never something? want anything so, i just wanted yeah. to be like well, exactly. you are like a huge inspiration and and i fucking love your work and that was kind of it but it's like you know he's probably heard that 10 million times he's probably sick of it that, but that's i mean I'll, I'll say this that's what he makes a living off of. right so I, that's completely fair yeah to say thank you to someone. If he was like, because if he was in the middle of arguing with someone on the phone right. or he's with family or he's with a kid, right, right. you know, like that's that's a whole separate thing. Totally. But when he's at the place he's going to do the work yeah. and you're thanking him for yeah. it, no, man. No, <laughs> no, no pass for him. I'll, I'll still Point give him deduction. a pass. I'm just such a big fan that I'm all right with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Dustin, thank you. Thank you very, very much for chatting. Uh, this was this was great. Yeah. It was great thank meeting you. Thank you so much. See ya. You've been listening to Blamo. A special thanks to Dustin and the crew over at Beach Fossils. Their new album, Bunny, is out now wherever you listen to music. Buy the LP, stream it, support the homies, do what you're going to do. If you like what you heard, you know the drill. Share the pod with a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, do all the deals. Follow us on Instagram for the hot content. If you want to give us your hot take, we'd love to hear from you. Or you can email us at info at Thanks.